my name is Sandy Lincoln. I run the place here, uh, a, um, a uh, local bookstore uh, with a bakery aside. And we do uh, always are interested in folks who are writing about our local culture, our local politics, um, what's happening in our state. And this book that Greg Guma has done, uh, Restless Spirits and Popular Movements, I have really resonated with me. I really enjoyed the scope of it over decades. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Greg, and uh, welcome everybody. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, let me begin by um, uh, telling you what I'm going to try to do the next, I guess, hour, hour and a quarter. Is that what we're talking about? Um, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit of a little bit of bi relevant biography, and then um, I'll discuss the books, uh, the book, and what it um, uh, what it attempts to do, uh, the process that I used uh, to write it, um, and um, tell you a few stories from it, um, and then uh, as a special treat, if there's time, I have a, a short uh, excerpt that didn't make it into the book to give you a sense of um, what might have occurred and what might occur in, in, in another book if I ever follow it up with something. Um, so uh, I've lived in Vermont since the late 60s. Um, uh, I moved here in 1968, fresh out of uh, Syracuse University. I was a, uh, a, a student of media um, uh, trained to be a writer, director, or something in, in mass media, and moved to Bennington and um, became a journalist um, for the daily newspaper there. And in a way, that was the beginning of my postgraduate education in, in Vermont. And I was also lucky enough during that same first five-year period when I was in my early to mid-20s to also work for Bennington College uh, at a crucial moment, 1970-71, uh, when there was a lot of ferment and uh, uh, radical activity going on. So I got to know the that part of the academic community and, be and met more people. And then eventually I became a, a government worker. I worked for the Department of Labor uh, as a counselor. And that got me much more deeply into the life of the community and people, um, uh, poor people, and people who, who were not treated well by the system. And those three jobs over a period of five years helped to frame my uh, understanding of, of Vermont and the beginning of my understanding of Vermont values. And I'm going to talk a little more about that. Uh, I eventually moved to uh, the Champlain Valley area, and I did a number of things. I ran a bookstore. I worked for the city government of Burlington. Um, uh, and eventually, I became involved in the activism of that period of the late 70s in, in Burlington. And um, some people describe me as an activist. I wouldn't say that's my primary definition. I've been an advocate at times, but I've also been more of a, an organizer of um, institutions and a manager of institutions. And I've run, over the years since then, a number of nonprofits, including the Peace and Justice Center in Burlington. I moved briefly to the Southwest, where I um, was the uh, director of an immigrant rights organization in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I ran a bookstore also in California for a while. And then eventually, years later, the executive director of the Pacifica Radio Network, which is the largest progressive radio network. And so that's the, sort of the span of my experience and always based in Vermont, but venturing out into the larger world and gradually over the time expanding my understanding of issues based on my own experience um, and also reading. And so this book, Restless Spirits and Popular Movements, has been in uh, formation for 45 years, really, at least 45 years. Um, I, I could say I seriously began working on Vermont history as a topic in uh, 1975 and 1976, leading up to the bicentennial. And if you recall, whenever there's a bicentennial or some sort of centennial celebration, there's a lot of hoopla about Americanism and what is the country and what is the state and so forth. And a lot of us then at that time, I was uh, still in my late 20s then, and uh, we felt that it was uh, a lot of hype. Um, we had a more radical perspective. 
uh, some of the people who were perhaps more radical than I was um, uh, ideologically um, wanted to write a, a people's history of Vermont. And uh, since I was an editor and writer, I could help them do that and wrote part of it with a group. So the first one would say the first initial draft of parts of this book were developed at that time and were an attempt to tell what we called Vermont's untold history, the stories that were not being captured by the establishment's uh, historical writers. Um, and I would say just in passing that you know, history is never a complete story. This history, like any other, is just one view of the past. It doesn't purport to be the only view or even necessarily a complete view. It's, a, it's, a, it's looking at it through a specific lens. And for many of those years, and up to and including the time when I first arrived here, um, history was largely written by establishment and largely Republican people because the Republicans had run the state for a hundred years. And so if I submitted an article even to a publication that was more general interest like Vermont Life saying I think we should have an article on the commune movement, they would say well that's not Vermont, we don't want to write about that because we don't want Vermont to, to be identified with that. And in terms of histor historical writing, there were certain areas that were just ignored. And so it wasn't until some years later that I really discovered how deep this sort of uh, uh, omission, these omissions went. But we were aware even then that there was a certain spin to the history. Um, and so we told stories about the labor movement, which was not really being discussed in a historical context in any serious way. The women's movement and women who, in Vermont history. And also a, an analysis of history based on, to a certain extent, class analysis. So a different interpretation of history. And this uh, was issued a couple of editions in, the, in 1976. Um, uh, it was a kind of a breakthrough, um, and it began me uh, thinking about how I could expand on it, because I was part of a group then, and uh, a lot of this was developed with other people. And I agreed with much of it, but I didn't feel it was yet a complete story. Um, uh, I felt that it was uh, driven to, to a certain extent too much by a specific ideology, and I was a, a journalist and a journalist and a social critic rather than an ideologue as such. And so I felt that it was necessary to, to dig deeper and, and look at other stories and stories that didn't necessarily fit as easily into the right-left paradigm. And so I began to collect these stories as I, as I wrote for different publications. And in Burlington, I was the editor of the first somewhat successful uh, alternative weekly newspaper, which Vermont Vanguard Press, uh, which allowed me to sort of explore some of these issues, contemporary as well as some historical issues, and, um, and develop new material. And then when Bernie Sanders was elected, it allowed me to get into the vault at City Hall, which had been kind of off limits <laughs> to most people. Um, and by doing that, I was able to look through the minutes of city council meetings, news clippings that were kept with those minutes, files, um, articles that, you know, weren't even in the library, that were just in this very literally musty, huge vault with all these handwritten notes. And so I, I discovered by doing that that there was a, a whole history of Burlington that had really never been written about since it had happened a hundred more than a hundred years ago and it told the story of another progressive movement a progressive movement preceding the bernie sanders progressive movement and um at the center of it was an irish catholic blacksmith named james burke who became mayor in 1903 and was in and out of the mayoral office many times until the 1930s. He entered politics in his 50s, and he was still in politics in his 80s. Uh, and he was really a progressive. Uh, he called himself a Roosevelt Democrat. He was a fan of Theodore Roosevelt. So he was against 
you know, the big, big capital and the trusts. Uh, he was for public power, for example, the beginning of public um, electrical power in Burlington, uh, Burlington begins with James Burke. He was the one who got it approved and, and got it start, started, and many other social improvements at that time. Now, he was conservative in some respects, but uh, primarily it showed that there was this other history that had really never been written about. You, If you look in Vermont History Magazine, um, going back, you know, to 50s, 60s, and 70s, you just will not find it. And even in some of the histories that have been written s since that time, it's really given rather short shrift. And I would say, given that Burlington is the largest city in Vermont, and that that was a, a, a long-term political movement that lasted decades, that it's significant. And so I began to write about it then and got some support from the Historical Society, and I've continued to research it since that time. And so that gave me the idea that, well, there are a number of these stories. And so I have continued to do that research. And about 10 years ago, I, I kind of eventually developed the first draft, which I called the Vermont Way, which is here. Um, and I began to publish parts of it. Um, uh, in Vermont Digger, there's a number of articles that are kind of early drafts of things that are in the book. Um, when I was working with them, they allowed me to publish some of that stuff. Um, some newspapers in Vermont published it. And I continued writing. I tried to approach a couple of different publishers who were kind of, you know, uh, divided as to... The, and again, the Vermont Historical Society still wasn't sure <laughs> how they felt about this, this, this take on Vermont history. Um, and uh, so I kind of worked it. Uh, then uh, Nora Jacobson, who I'm working with again now, um, was doing her film on uh, Vermont history, the Vermont movie, which I don't know if you've seen, but I would highly recommend it. It's a six-part documentary that was aired on on public television at one point um, and has sort of sparked a whole other new area of, of Vermont history research. And Robin and I uh, developed one of the segments in that movie, which was about the Green Mountain, Mountain Parkway, another largely ignored, though not completely ignored, moment in Vermont history that doesn't really fit neatly into a left-right paradigm. And it is about, uh, just to sort of summarize it briefly, is about the idea that um, a lot of the su people who called themselves progressives at that time wanted to see a, a, a highway built up the spine of the Appalachian Trail, a 250-mile road right up the center of Vermont. And this was uh, by um, th those who supported it to get Vermont out of what they called the mountain mentality to make to link Vermont with the larger world so it wouldn't be as isolated. Um, there was a depression. This is in the 30s. And so there was also an economic reason it would create jobs. It would spur other forms of development. Um, and some people thought it was a great idea, but there was also resistance. Some of the resistance was environmental resistance or conservationist. Some of the resistance was conservative uh, as well. We don't want to have, have the wrong kind of people coming up to Vermont. We don't want it uh, to be like the Catskills, which was a kind of a somewhat anti-Semitic uh, slur at that time. Um, and so it became a really a, a cause that divided the state and eventually made its way to the state legislature because they had to approve state funding to match the federal money that was being offered. Um, and the state legislature couldn't resolve the issue either. Um, and so they turned it over to ta a town meeting vote, which is an, a, a little used uh, provision that is permitted by the state legislature. We don't have referendum and recall in Vermont, but we do have the the possibility that the state legislature can ask for the towns to vote on a matter of public interest. And that's happened in a number of, a few cases. And this was one of them. And so in, in uh, 1936, uh, there was a vote on town meeting day. And uh, the road was, uh, well, it, it, technically it wasn't defeated, it was postponed because they offered two dates two starting dates, immediately or in five years. But everybody understood that five years meant probably never. Um, the, uh, the southern part of the state, 
was primarily opposed to it. The northern part of the state was, to some extent, in favor of it. The Rutland Herald was opposed. The Burlington Free Press was in favor. So it, it divided the state. And it doesn't really fit into, again, a simple left-right thinking, because some people even today will argue that, well, if the road had been built, then all the ski developments that happened probably wouldn't have happened. They would have been controlled. And, you know, maybe that would have been better. And, and other people feel that it would have been a terrible form of development. And so it's a it's a complex issue. It's a, uh, an issue that divides people in a number of different ways. And uh, some people, some historians, feel that it really is a kind of a, a really uh, good example of both town meeting democracy and the state's desire to remain somewhat different from the rest of the United States. Um, that people were saying, no, 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 we don't, we don't need this development, even if it does create jobs. So that's one of the stories, and that's in a chapter in the book. So I've been collecting these stories for a long time, um, and I would say that the book also is an attempt beyond telling stories um, to define a set of values that uh, I believe exist in Vermont and have evolved. I think different states have different core values. That isn't to say that you know people are all, are all di that different, but different states evolve in different ways, and they develop different sensibilities, social sensibilities and political sensibilities. And so I, this book is an attempt, through these stories of individuals and the movements that they were involved with, to define what I think are a set of core values. And uh, just to list them, and you have to read the book to sort of see how I explain them, is um, the political values of autonomy and of accountability, citizen government, and local control. These are, I think, pretty obvious, and everybody is sort of familiar with how they are reflected. Ecological values, conservation, balance, uh, and human scale, which, of course, is easier in Vermont than in some other places that are larger, but that's part of the nature of the state. And social values, the social values of tolerance, sometimes expressed in, you know, uh, you don't bother me, I won't bother you, um, um, uh, and also solidarity and dissent. And these are, I think, values that have emerged and evolved over the state's history and have been reflected in the various social movements that have succeeded in the state. And so you'll see, if you read the book, that uh, mixed in with the storytelling is an attempt to examine these values and, and uh, define them in relationship to the state. Um, so there's also a, a variety of biographical sketches, um, just to give you an idea of, of what some of them are. Um, I begin with the, uh, with the revolutionary and the, even the pre-revolutionary period. I tell stories of some of the, uh, the, uh, the Native American uh, lifestyle during the pre-revolutionary period. I tell the story of Matthew Lyon, for example, who was a, who was a revolutionary era uh, hero who um, was uh, an ally of the Allens and who um, eventually got on the wrong side of John Adams during the uh, Adams administration and was jailed for uh, sedition. Um, the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed by John Adams during his administration because of his fear of a of dissent uh, in the buildup of uh, hostilities with France, particularly. Um, and but uh, but people in Vermont didn't agree with John Adams, and uh, while he was in jail in Virgins, he was reelected to Congress while in jail, <laughs> and eventually participated in the vote critically that elected Thomas Jefferson. He cast the deciding vote in that contested election. Um, so I tell that story. I, I discuss the Allen family and their influence on the state during the Revolutionary period. Um, I discuss some of the um, religious movements in the state, um, the, um, the, the Millerites, the Noyes Utopians, um, who eventually moved to, to New York, um, Joseph Smith, um, who was uh, founder of the, uh, the Mormons, who uh, grew up here and then eventually moved west and eventually ran for president as well. He was one of the... He was probably the first Vermonter, Vermont native, who ran for president and was actually assassinated during his presidential campaign. 
He was a, he was jailed in Illinois because of a um, uh, well, people were were uh, had conflicting views about his settlement, uh, uh, Nauvoo, this this community he had founded, and he was being attacked for um, polyamory, um, uh, uh, multiple marriages and uh, was eventually put in jail. And while he was in jail, the, they stormed the jail, a, a crowd, a mob stormed the jail and uh, killed his brother. And he died jumping from a window <laughs> while firing a gun. Uh, it was quite, quite a, a dramatic end. That was in 1844. Um, and that this set the stage for the rise of Brigham Young, by the way. Um, I talk about the anti-Mason movement, which was the first third party movement in, in the country, really. And this was, uh, I believe, a, an embryonic anti-monopoly movement. It was a movement against elites and secret oaths. And while in most of the country it did not rise to success, in Vermont it did. We had an anti-Mason governor, governor for about four years. Um, each election was contested in the legislature. They had the multiple rounds of voting to see who would be elected um, because no one had gotten a, an absolute majority. But he was the governor of the state, William Palmer. And, um, and to some extent, uh, and that set the stage for one of the most significant um, amendments to the Vermont Constitution, the creation of the Senate. In Vermont, we had a unicameral legislature until that time, and and after his uh, four or five years in power, um, uh, they decided that uh, that it might be, and and to some extent, this was the bankers who decided that uh, we should create a second house, a, a Senate. Uh, so there were constitutional amendments, and also the the uh, the process of amending the constitution was also changed at that time and so that had a, and it also uh, the anti-masons in addition to that held the first nominating conventions a lot of the modern political architecture that frames how we elect people and select people were tested out by the anti-mason movement which was a a populist uprising against elite power um, uh, secret, secret, secret cabals, you might say, or at least what they suspected were, were those uh, cabals. And Thaddeus Stevens, who became a, a, a primary uh, opponent of slavery and very influential in the Republican Party, started out as an anti-Mason. Um, I discuss uh, feminists like Clarina Nichols, who was, um, who was influential in passing some progressive state legislation in the mid 19th century, but who is one of these people who, who found in the end that she had to leave Vermont um, in order to really pursue her own interests. And there were a number of these people. Matthew Lyon was another. He, he did what he did in Vermont, and then he moved on to Kansas. <laughs> you know, and uh, so in some in some states, in some cases. Uh, Vermonters have made a great contribution and then have gone elsewhere, or some people have come to the state. In more recent years, there are people who weren't born here and have come to the state and have made a contribution. So in-migration and out-migration is also a theme in the book, and, and the contributions that people make when they're really um, uh, active in the state. And I, I bring it up into the 20th century, and as I get into the 20th century, I begin to draw more on my own experiences as a journalist, um, starting in the 1960s. And uh, I include, you know, interviews and observations that I I made with some of the people who are um, who have who are more familiar to us. Um, I also discuss the contributions. Um, of Republicans because Republicans ran this state for a hundred years. From uh, there was no more Republican state than Vermont from 1860 to uh, 1962, when Phil Hoff was the first Democratic governor elected uh, in a hundred years. So um, Republicans were such a large big tent party that they adopted certain procedures that would allow them to manage power in a more balanced way. They had something called the mountain rule. Someone would would be governor from the eastern part of the state and the next governor would be from the western part of the state. And they went back and forth and they had a kind of an order of succession and uh, for, for many years. 
And then out of that eventually grew what is known popularly as the Aiken-Gibson wing of the party, one could say progressive Republicans, who broke the mountain rule, they decided enough of that, opposed the marble interests who largely controlled the Republican Party, and George Aiken was, was one of the people who rose to power during that time as governor and then a U.S. senator, and Ernest Gibson, uh, the father, was an influential Republican and his son became governor. Um, and they uh, were the people who, who began to bring Vermont into the modern era and to view Vermont uh, state government's role in a more expansive way. Because prior to that, the role of government had been highly limited in Vermont. Vermont had sort of fallen behind in development, one could say, to a large extent. And these uh, politicians who were Republicans saw this. They saw the need for a social safety net, for example. Um, and Ernest Gibson was though he did not succeed in all respects, was a person who put that on the table for the Republican Party. So the Republicans of the 40s and the 50s and the 60s were not always conservatives. They were tended to be middle of the road. And there was a, a, kind, of, a kind of Republican that I think Phil Scott actually reflects even to this day, who was not bound to to ideology of the Republican Party, but was bound to the nature of the state and and to a much more uh, a broader view of the state, to some extent born of the fact that it would, had been a one-party state for so long. Um, so I, I bring it up to the present date. I talk about Phil Hoff, uh, Richard Snelling. There are biographical sketches of both of them, and I, I knew them both and interviewed them both. Um, uh, and uh, eventually, we get to Burlington. Um, where um, I was part of the uh, what was known then as the Sanders Revolution, and I've written an, I wrote an earlier book after Bernie Sanders was mayor called The People's Republic, that was published um, I think thirty something years ago, um, which was the first sort of study of that of that period, um, and so I experienced that as the editor of the newspaper, as an activist, as a participant in some of the changes that took place. I worked with Robin a lot during that period, and, and so there's a chapter in the book that revisits some of the material in the People's Republic and then brings it up to date. It talks about how Bernie became a national figure, his races for president, his political philosophy. Um, and I would say, uh, just as a side note, that it's probably a bit kinder to him than this book is. This book is Bernie Sanders, Warts and All. Um, it's really a deep dive into what happened during the, that particular eight-year period when he was mayor. We knew each other uh, fairly well. We had known each other from his early days in Vermont. Uh, it was a somewhat fractious relationship. Um, uh, but in this book, I'm trying to um, be more objective and less personal, um, and so just trying to present him as he is without bringing myself into the story. Um, and um, so that brings up to the present day. I discuss, you know, more recent social movements. I do, we do, the book does cover the, the women's movement and the labor movement at different stages. Um, and it does discuss the evolution of capitalism in Vermont, but in uh, perhaps a less ideological framed way. Um, I tend to be more of a, um, uh, I would describe myself as a left-wing libertarian, and so I've worked with people uh, to some extent who are conservative as well as progressives, and so the writing and the insights reflect all of that. Um, and so I can write about the secession movement, which a lot of people would like to just sort of make believe it never happened, which I think um, should be on the table again fairly soon, in my opinion. If I was projecting forward, I, I don't know whether it will be called that, um, probably not, um, but uh, given the state of the country, it certainly um, and the and the Republicans' desire to turn all power back to the states, uh, states like Vermont, that were that was defined as the reluctant republic from the beginning, which wasn't part of the original United States, by the way, was an independent republic for 14 years. Um, so I think that that's worth at least mentioning and acknowledging that it is also a thread in the, hist in the history of Vermont as a social movement. Um, 
So that's what the book uh, covers. Um, uh, let me see. I want to leave some time for questions. What time are we at? Um, 11.40. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop in a, in, a, in a moment, but I wanted to read you this because the book doesn't, I, you know, I had to limit it to some extent. I could have, I could have written a five or 600 page book, but I wanted to write something that was digestible, that was, that was on point, that was sort of really made the case that I was trying to make. And so you have to decide when you're writing this sort of thing, what to include and what to not to include. But I'll just read you this, which is part of the first draft of for the Vermont Way, as I originally drafted it. And um, and I thought it would be interesting because um, uh, it's still controversial in a way. Um, and it's about uh, a moment in the history of Woodstock. The Rockefeller influence was felt intensely in Woodstock, where Lawrence Rockefeller turned a trading center for local farmers into a Tony destination for tourists and the wealthy. He became the town's largest employer through various corporate subsidiaries and amassed 20 times the capital investment of anyone else. Once Rockefeller came to town, land values and property taxes went so high that most native Vermonters had to leave. By 1971, he had become secure enough to commandeer the entire town for a gathering of one of the world's most influential groups at his Woodstock Hotel and Estate, known as the Bilderberg Group. It had been meeting privately since 1954, according to Prince, uh, Prince Bernard, the Dutch aristocrat who promoted it and chaired its sessions for more than 30 years. The purpose of the conference is that eminent persons in every field get the opportunity to speak freely without being hindered by the knowledge that their words and ideas will be analyzed, commented upon, and eventually criticized in the press. The Woodstock meeting, convened on April 23rd, was billed as an international peace conference. Even though state government supplied 30 men in plain clothes to back up a private armed security force, not to mention the FBI and Secret Service, Vermont officials professed to know nothing about the event at the time. Some disagree with this, by the way. Meanwhile, 150 guards and officers blanketed the small town. Everything had to be safe and secure for the arrival of 85 leaders from around the world. Limousines brought most of them from Lebanon, New Hampshire, where an air shuttle from Boston had been arranged. After his plane touched ground in Boston's Logan Airport, Prince Bernard issued a terse press statement about the gathering, but one participant, Francois Duchesne of the London Institute of Strategic Studies, who attended with then British Defense Minister Dennis Healy, was more candid. America must face a Western Europe and Japan that are more independent, he explained. Apropos, one scheduled topic was a change in the U.S. role in the world. Major Glenn Davis of the Vermont State Police called it a hairy scene. No one seemed to know just who was in charge of what, he said. In the conference room, however, once all the employees had been cleared out of the building, all order reigned. Seated, seating was alphabetical, with Bernard at the head of the table. Remarks were normally limited to five minutes, with two working papers to focus the discussion. Henry Kissinger, then Nixon's national security advisor, missed the first session, but became the main event when he delivered a briefing on U.S. policy. Months later, he was charged by conservatives with leaking plans for Nixon's China trip and the devaluation of the dollar. After the so-called Masters of the Universe convened in Vermont, uh, in Vermont, banks and major corporations shifted capital out of the U.S. mainly to West Germany, and Nixon's China initiative became public information. That December, the dollar was devalued, resulting in gains for people who knew enough ahead of time to convert to European currency. Vermont's once prized isolation from the outside world seemed to be coming to an end. So that's a story that's uh, not in the book, but I thought would be of some interest to some of you. Um, and uh, this piece of paper is a letter from uh, <laughs> to the editor of the Vanguard Press, where some of this was originally published in the late 70s, um, to the editor of the paper, who is saying that he, he, uh, this is from Marcellus Parsons, who was the anchor of the, uh, the CAX Evening News at that time, who was complimenting the editor on the launch of our new newspaper, but wasn't too impressed with my article. 
because he felt that I had been reading the Manchester Union Leader. He felt that I was sort of getting involved in conspiracy theories. But he and he writes and he spends most of the letter sort of giving his take on what was going on. And he ends by thinking, uh, saying, I think one extreme is to call them policy shaping meetings of magnates about to manage the world economy, and the other would be to describe it as leaders of all fields, economic, political, journalistic, who just want to sit down for a giant off-the-record bull session. So that's how he viewed it. Good. Well, thank you. So, excuse me. And, um, yeah, so I'd like to uh, thank Greg for speaking here at Sandy's... Uh, um, Book and Bakery. I'm Robin Lloyd with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and we're a co-sponsor of this event, and we're holding the Vermont Wolf Gathering here. Some of you uh, who are readers up and or viewers up in Montpelier might know about the Peace and Freedom, uh, which is our newsletter, and I'm leaving some copies here. And uh, so thank you, Greg. And I guess the question I'd like to ask to start to start a discussion is: um, so Vermont has never elected a woman to the Congress, to the Senate, or the House, and right now we're involved. Uh, some of our listeners here are from Massachusetts, so they don't know all of our politics. But um, could you give your opinion on how that's going? How the, the current races? Go? Yeah, the current races and well, I'm, this is a historical uh, book, and so you know, I don't know that I feel any qu more qualified than anyone else to comment on the state of politics in the immediate moment. I think it's long, certainly it's long overdue for a, uh, a woman to represent Vermont in Congress. Um, I make note of that in the book. Madeline Cunin is the only woman governor, um, and. Um, I would say, uh, without sort of passing judgment uh, on any of the candidates, it's what it strikes me is that I'm, I'm certainly enthusiastic about all the women running for Congress. However, I would like to see more women in influential positions in state government. And to some extent, some of the women who are running for Congress could just as easily have run for state office. Of course, Phil Scott is a very popular governor, and so that would not be an easy race. Well, but, there is one candidate running for governor, uh, Brenda, Brenda Siegel, I believe. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. You know, um, yeah. So, so I think that you know, uh, women in Vermont, um, in the Vermont political system are not well represented in, in local governments. There are very few women actually in positions of, of, of power in local governments in Vermont. They have uh, gained a lot of influence in, in committees and in leadership in the Vermont legislature, particularly in the House. Um, and certainly this is a, um, a moment um, when, uh, when I think it's probably inevitable that a woman will be elected to Congress, and I would say that's a, it's a, a good step. Uh, a related issue, however, is the extent to which the political system is 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 a more of a um, is open or not. We have very liberal ballot access laws, which means that almost anybody um, can run for office if they wish. On the other hand, there is also a very strong political establishment, and the fact that that uh, Peter Welsh seems to be walking into a Senate seat from his House seat pretty easily, uh, almost inheriting it from Bernie Sanders, um, strikes me as part of the downside of being a small state, that um, the political system is not necessarily as open as it could be. So I think this is a breakthrough, um, but um, uh, I think there's more work to be done to make this a system of politics that really does welcome newcomers. I wonder, since two of our guests here are from uh, Massachusetts, that actually Massachusetts is much more woman controlled than Vermont now, I believe. So would one of you be willing to comment on that? 
Um, I'd be willing to give it a try, uh, but I would very much like to uh, add this, that I truly appreciate you filling in the gaps in history because we've badly needed that throughout the United States and all states. Um, and I wonder if you have or will in the future address the uh, people of color issue within the state and indigenous, the natives uh, who are obviously in the state and how their life has been over the centuries uh, regarding legislation, whatever. Um, I am not in Boston area, so I'll, I'll pass a lot of the baton regarding uh, the legislation of females in Massachusetts. Oh, by the way, I'm Eileen Krakowski. I'm from Newton outside of Boston, and um, I've been part of Wilf uh, for, I don't know, several years. I wish I joined it sooner. Very, very smart women who are keeping up with issues. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that I've been very pleased with the number of bright women who are running in various offices. Um, and most of them in, in the metropolitan and inner Boston area. In fact, um, as you'll find out, the minorities are predominantly the voters in Boston proper right now, which is very exciting. And we have a minority uh, represented mayor. Um, I personally find my mayor, though, in Newton, uh, very Republican leaning and, and uh, not really listening to the anti-war message that we try. She's very politically astute, though. And she shows up at the right times, like when the Ukraine war started. She was there with our vigils on Monday and the special events that the city had. And I truly appreciate that, but it's more tokenism and it's upsetting. Um, but I think Boston is more progressive, and so I'll, I'll turn the, uh, the, the video over to uh, Virginia Pratt. Hi, I'm Virginia Pratt, and I do live in Boston. I've been there for, uh, since 1976, um, and um, I've been a member of WILF for over 20 years. Um, Yes, uh, the tide has really turned, I think, in the state in many ways and in um, the city. Um, we, in terms of Massachusetts, we currently have a very well-liked Republican uh, governor who um, probably remained Republican governor and held in good standing because he never went along with Trump. And, just about anything he never, he always, almost always parted company. We have uh, Maura Healy, who's our Attorney General, who's running for Governor. Uh, and she and Sonia Chang Diaz were both running for Governor as Democrats. Sonia Chang Diaz represented many neighborhoods in Boston as a Senator and dropped out. And she was viewed as more progressive in some ways. but. Um, but uh, our Attorney General, uh, Maura Healy, has uh, had met multiple lawsuits on Trump. Um, so um, she's, I, I, I mean, I think for national standards, she's going to be viewed as very progressive. Um, our mayor uh, for Boston, Mayor Wu, uh, is um, Asian American and um, worked closely with. Senator Warren, um, and Elizabeth Warren, who ran for president um, and uh, was one of her students when she was a law student at Harvard. Uh, Senator Warren taught at Harvard and was a bankruptcy attorney and um, has always been a, a champion of the working people and always trying to take on issues of uh, making health care affordable. Um, having consumer protections and uh, also now very active on and outspoken about uh, reproductive rights. Um, we also have Iana Presley in Boston who is our, um, our representative 
at the federal level, and um, she is part of the people called the squad. And when you meet her in person, she will say, or you go to events, she'll say, my politics or my policy comes from the people with the pain. And I have seen that, like I've seen her at, uh, there was an outdoor event where she was endorsing uh, Ricardo um, Arroyo, who's uh, on our city council. His, his father was the first Latino to get into uh, the city hall and then uh, running our probate court system. And he was a, um, uh, the attorney's uh, public defender attorney, uh, uh, the younger Arroyo. And, oh, sorry, I'm going too long. Um, so the question, anyway, um, I think we're, I think in Massachusetts we're in a good place, um, particularly with um, being strong on issues of public fairness um, and also reproductive rights has just lit the fire for a lot of engagement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I want to make just uh, to, to respond to your first point about uh, because this is a history. I don't deal so much with the things that have happened in the last ten or so years, but <laughs> I do have um, a, I do give a lot of consideration to the role and treatment of both uh, indigenous people in Vermont, historically speaking, as well as the uh, Vermont's role in the anti-slavery movement, which was actually quite um, quite good. Um, Vermont's the first state to abolish slavery. It's in the, it was in the original Vermont Constitution. Um, its representatives were constantly bringing petitions. It was part of the Underground Railroad. So, but on the other hand, you know there there were racist enclaves. The Klan did exist here and did make a comeback. Um, some institutions were very slow to 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 respond, and also. Um, the eugenics movement played a role in the treatment of Native Americans in the 20s and 30s. Um, they weren't the only populations, also the uh, French Canadians were also affected by this. There was a sterilization program um, that, uh, in which hundreds if not thousands of people were, without informed consent, um, uh, were, were sterilized. And so I write about that um, in the book. And so I write about Vermont's progressive values, but on the other hand, I don't ignore the ways in which it was somewhat behind the curve or backward. Um, and the treatment of women is to some extent that Vermont, even when Vermont, uh, when the suffrage was passed in the 20s, the Vermont governor, who was a Republican at the time, wouldn't call a special session to, you know, to adopt the constitutional amendment. Uh, and a lot of women did feel that they just couldn't break through in Vermont, that this was a very patriarchal environment to some extent that has something to do with the fact where it was a sort of one somewhat of a late bloomer in the uh, in the emergence of women in power in politics um, and so I discussed some of those issues in a historical context but I agree with you that more um, contemporary research needs to be done and to some extent I'm kind of trying to do an overview open up a lot of areas for discussion that haven't really been given enough attention, raise some questions. I don't purport to answer all of those questions or be the, the last word on some of these things. Um, and, um, you know, I had another point about uh, the, um, uh, the political environment that uh, Vermont is in. I, I sometimes discuss Vermont as being the anti-Texas. Um, mm -hmm. That you know, Texas is is sort of very aggressive in promoting its values, and right now, the sort of the vigilante uh, authoritarian culture. I, I don't know if it's ground zero, but it's one of those places. And Vermont has a again has a very distinct and different set of values. It's a small state, and to some extent, that's the reason why it's easy to ignore. Because you know people don't come here to campaign that often because you know you're not going to get very many votes and you kind of already know what the outcome is going to be. But on the other hand, Vermont could be more uh, forthcoming in projecting its values to the rest of the country. And the fact that we've had 
two candidates for significant candidates for president over the last 20 years is a part of that story. Um, Howard Dean and, and Bernie Sanders both um, had a significant impact. Howard Dean is somewhat forgotten now because his campaign kind of got derailed, um, you know, to some extent, as I write in the book, by unfair media coverage. I mean, he did make mistakes, but on the other hand, no one, no candidate running for president in that year got more negative coverage than he got. That's a statistically provable fact. Um, so he was targeted because he was considered outside the mainstream of the Republican Party. He was running against the war at a time when mainstream Democratic opinion was still supportive of the war. He ran to take back our country. He wanted to mobilize the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party. These are the things he said. Uh, he didn't perhaps listen to advisors as much, and he made some mistakes. But um, he was a guy who was actually not that progressive, but understood the historical moment and took advantage of it and did project some of Vermont's values. And Bernie Sanders also has projected Vermont's ideas about, about the, uh, how the country could be different. And I think that you don't have to be a big state to, to have a big influence. And, and if anything, I would think that, uh, in a way, Vermont is a bit shy um, about uh, not one, it wants to be, it likes to be different. It thinks it's ahead of the curve. To some extent, it doesn't want to be ruined by too much attention. That's to some extent why it was not one of the first states to legalize pot, for example. One of the reasons that legislators gave that they didn't want to become like Colorado, they want to become a hippie mecca, or you know. They were concerned about this. Uh, and so there's a concern about image, cultivated, a carefully cultivated image of Vermont, which I think is worth projecting. Right now, it's projected more in vague ideas projected through popular media and film. Oh, it's that beautiful place you go to get away, to have your romantic weekend. It's the place where Ben and Jerry's is. If you, if you uh, listen to films, uh, watch films, you will see Vermont is often referenced in films in a very positive, almost Shangri-La kind of way. It's the, it's and, the great and escape. And the wildfires. That's why some people are coming here, is to escape the wildfires in California. Right. On the other hand, I just saw a, a night or two ago an absolutely horrendous portrayal of Vermont on the series FBI Most Wanted. It was supposedly set in Vermont. Not a foot of the footage was actually filmed in Vermont. And what it was about was about a couple that wanted to start doing recreational marijuana, but were involved with funding, uh, laundering money for the Russian mafia. And so the FBI descends of Vermont. These two people who are sort of vaguely hippie-ish are murdering people, um, and then, you know, it's just like, it's a kind of Vermont, it's a Vermont, you'd say, what is this place? This is not at all, you know, what I would have imagined Vermont was like. Now, you know, is we have... Is this a true story? No, no, oh. it's completely fictional. It's oh, completely okay. fictional. I think they just picked the state, uh, it's almost at random. It could have been set in any state. Uh -huh. The hook was, oh, Vermont just legalized pot. Right, and these people are somehow trying to sort of launch a legit business after being, you know, underground growers. And, and but they, in order to fund their, you know, their project and get their license, which they don't get, they get money from the Russian mafia. So it ends up, and and they have a Middlebury College professor of languages who is presented at the beginning of the show as being, you know, just this lovely, meek, you know, Vermonter. She ends up being the criminal mastermind and ends up being shot in a warehouse full of pot. I mean, it was, I mean, that was the, the nightmare image of Vermont. This is not the state that we know, but, you know, that show's seen by, I don't know, 10 million people, you know? So um, most of Vermont's image is bucolic and is somewhat uh, fanciful. Um, some of it is nightmarish, but I don't think that the state 
is projecting its brand and its agenda to the extent that it could. Um, and I, if I would say something about the women who get to Congress, I hope that they will do better than the men have done. Um, <clears throat> because we've, we're coming out of an era where it's been personal politics and everybody building their own brand and, you know, uh, trying to sort of, you know, find their own specific place. Not so, much, not so much about the state. And I would say Bernie, though he represents Vermont, is really a national figure and rarely talks about Vermont. Mm -hmm. Or to some extent because in the end, he doesn't really think it's different. He would not necessarily agree with the analysis in my book that his view is capitalism is capitalism. States are states. They're, Pretty much it's all the same. It's the good guys and the bad guys. It's the left versus the right. It's the capitalists versus the people. Um, this is his analysis, which, you know, uh, was an easy explanation when I was in my 20s. But frankly, the world is more complicated than that. And I think Vermont's image and way of approaching issues is worth discussing with a larger public in a more nuanced way. So. I hope the women who get elected will do that. Well, there are two issues that are before the state legislature now. One is to make uh, abortion uh, uh, constitutionally legal by putting it into the state con constitution. And the other is to refine the, um, the declaration on slavery, which Right. was not, uh, which allowed uh, some sort of serfdom or yes. uh, people to be put in in jail more, I don't know whether maybe... It wasn't know. slavery, but it allowed, yes, right, indentured servitude. Yeah, yeah, it allowed indentured servitude. So that is another issue that's being brought before uh, the state legislature, and I guess it will be in uh, January. And those are two issues that are, you know, those are important uh, changes to make. and moving things forward. I think that's great. I'm, 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 I'm all in favor of that. I would just go back to saying that uh, Vermont was the repu uh, reluctant republic. I believe we're entering into an era where we need to raise some fundamental questions about the future of the country, um, uh, the extent to which it is functionally one country, um, whether it can be in the future and how issues and values such as diversity play into that. And I know this may be provocative for some people even here in this room, but does one size fit all? Do we want one solution for the entire country? Do we believe that there is one core set of values that the country could ever get behind? In the, in the 20th century, in the mid 20th century particularly, it was very easy to sort of uh, uh, you know, kind of gloss over the regional, the, the very distinct differences in different parts of the country. To, in my view, the Civil War was never settled. The South and the North, the, or the Southern view of the country and the, the quote unquote Northern view of the country, are, are fundamentally different. And you may be trying to reconcile the irre irreconcilable. And we may need a new social contract that will involve some fundamental changes in, that are already in progress. And, you know, we might want to change the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court is going in a certain direction. And the direction they're going in, although it's, it's overturning precedent, is also based on certain things that are built into the Constitution. This is a this is a, a, a confederal system. A lot of power it does rest with states. Now we may decide we don't want to do that, but is it possible to create an enormous 350 million person one nation and maintain that for so many years? In Germany and Germany is not France. There's a European Union, but they are have distinct cultures. And they have found a way to make that work. I think that Vermont has a different way of addressing problems than other states. Then uh, that I think that issues like nullification, 
are going to be on the table going forward. And that rather than simply resist that, we need to figure out the way in which we can recast the social contract, which has respect for diversity and doesn't force everybody to live life the same way. Now, some people may feel that's not idealistic enough, but, uh, but I think it's at least worth debating. Um, I don't think Texas is ever going to be like Vermont. <laughs> Thank you. Very thought provoking. You you actually bring up bring up a lot of issues that are worth thinking about. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. What was the uh, the straw that uh, broke the camel's back on changing the Republican position of a Lincoln into Democratic thinking? Uh, was there a Mansion involved? Who who? Uh, decided to go against his party and actually in, in flexed into the party to make an intentional change? Well, I mean, the Republicans, see, my, my family were Republicans, um, and but they were not conservative Republicans. They were known as Rockefeller Republicans. Now, Rockefeller was a, was a big capitalist, and yeah. we, we hated him. But on the other hand, he was a liberal, and he actually gave a speech at the, um, uh, just before I think the Republican convention in 1964, at the, which was a turning point when Barry Goldwater was, uh, was selected, warning against what was happening within the Republican Party. The Republican Party was more supportive of, to some extent, civil rights than the Democratic Party. The, the, you know, the, the Democrats were really much more resistant. In a way, ideologically, there's been a flip that's taken place over the last 50, 60 years since I was a kid um, in the nature of, of, of politics. So I would say nationally, it was a gradual uh, change that the the um, the fringe of the Republican Party became eventually the mainstream, it, and, and that was underway certainly at least 10 years ago uh, as a backlash, I would say, probably to the election of Obama to a certain extent, and then accelerated by, by Trump. But uh, up until the late 60s and Nixon's quote-unquote Southern strategy, the Republican Party certainly had a liberal wing in it. That's why you could get legislation passed. The bipartisanship everybody looks at to be this, you know, this thing of the past that we used to, you know, make work, worked because there were conservative Democrats and liberal Democrats. There were conservative Republicans and there were liberal Republicans. They might be different on certain economic questions, but on a lot of social and cultural questions, they were not that divided, and there was a majority for a, a progressive thrust that existed. Now we're in a situation where uh, we make the, um, the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, there's no room for nuance. There's no room for compromise. Compromise is a dirty word. Um, uh, and that's true on both sides, but I think the Republicans went there first. Um, and uh, so I, in Vermont, the change, the political dynamic changed in the 60s. Uh, we had in Vermont a, a situation where even though the Democrats were, were gaining ground locally, right, and more people were, were, were voting Democratic, we did not have uh, one man, one vote. Burlington had one vote in the state legislature, and Rochester had one vote in the state legislature. That wasn't fair. And then eventually there was a Supreme Court challenge, which had forced Vermont legislature to reapportion itself on the basis of one man, one vote. And that gave more power to Democrats and urban uh, voters. And that began the cultural change. And then the second thing that changed Vermont was the patterns of migration two major in-migrations, one in the 50s and to the 60s, of uh, ex-urban professionals, you know, doctors, lawyers, people who wanted to make a new start, entrepreneurs who kind of left Boston and New York and Pennsylvania and came up here. And then a decade later, countercultural people who came up here in large numbers. And in a state that's only 650,000 people, if you have a lot of in-migration and you have a somewhat depressed economy, which means that the young tend to leave the state, creating an out-migration, 
eventually the social consensus will begin to change, and that's what began to happen in the 70s. And then it was accelerated in the 80s by the rise of Bernie in Burlington, which in the largest city, and he had this megaphone to the entire state, and that also forced the Democratic Party to really move more in a progressive direction. So in Vermont, it, the social consensus moved to the left, but in much of the rest of the country, it was captured through gerrymandering and other mechanisms by the right. And now we have minority rule in this country. I mean, we really do. Uh, I agree. And, and so, I mean, that's that's my general take on it. Yeah. And you answered my questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you something about, yeah. um, maybe you're familiar with Rick Winston's book, Red Scare in the yeah. Green Mountains. Yeah, sure. What do, you, what do you think about that, about McCarthyism? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I didn't get into this because I couldn't tell all the stories I wanted to tell. And I like I, I like uh, Rick's book. I, I actually quoted and referenced it in my book. I, I used it as a source. Uh, the story I tell about that era, because mine is more of an anecdotal history covering a much broader historical period, I talk about uh, the Republican who was influential in stopping Joseph McCarthy. I think he covers it in his book, but his book, um, Ralph Flanders, yeah. And I, I really focus on Ralph Flanders as being an atypical uh, person who was really not a liberal. He was, he was sort of somewhat of a fundamentalist even in his religious and spiritual beliefs. He thought it was there was this great battle going on between you know, the forces of good and evil in the world. But he was a he was a, a a senator who could see through McCarthy's bluster and called him out. He was one of the first people who called out McCarthy, um, you know, and really ridiculed him in public and sided with the Democrats and helped the Democrats win a majority in Congress in 1954, which kind of began to set the stage for the uh, the ouster of McCarthy, and so you know. I guess I used it to tell us uh, to tell a particular story about a person who I felt reflected ver certain Vermont values. Again, going back to my sort of search for values, um, but Rick does tell a great story about you know the the influence of McCarthyism in Vermont and and how institutions were to some extent captured, you know, uh, or intimidated. Um, by by McCarthy, by just a few people who, you know, who could who could, you know, get a, a platform um, and use cherry pick evidence, you know, to sort of indict a whole culture, um, and a lot of people were intimidated. But uh, no, his that's very significant research that he's done, um, uh, and uh, you know, I, I know Rick and um, we we correspond. That's a good question. Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was great. Whoa, I'm so glad it came.